Thank you uh, for coming. Thank you for the faculty and the students. It's great to see some of my former students uh, in attendance. So today's talk, as you can see from the title, Common Sense and Good Sense, Everyday Economists and Their Discourses of Capitalism. And so this is uh, from the uh, self-promotion time, uh, forthcoming book uh, that will be published by Rutledge in April, titled The Discourses of Capitalism, Everyday Economists and Production of Common Sense. There's only just a, f a few ways in which to keep tweaking the title for various talks. Um, so, uh, this was drawn from a public uh, art project by uh, the, the artist Steve Lambert. And he had posted this on his uh, social media page, Vimeo page, and I'd come across it in various posts. Uh, and I found it very interesting. So, what he had done was uh, this uh, <clears throat> street art project, as you can see, Capitalism Works For Me. It's about as high as this um, ceiling, uh, and almost just about as wide. And he took it to New York City, uh, here in Boston, London. He took it to the Midwest. Uh, and when people would see this, they would be able to vote on this. Uh, this is in the Times Square installation. And they were able to vote on this console, true or false whether or not where it works for them, okay? So just a quick show of hands. I'm just kind of curious to see uh, how many here, if you'd like to raise your hands, do you think capitalism works for you? True? Raise your hands. What? Nobody? Nobody? Come on. No? All right. No? False? 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 Okay. Some people, are, you can't, you have to choose. You can't be on the fence. Come on. False. Can't be, uh, all right. So, um, so, uh, so uh, with the people who, the passers-by who uh, voted, um, the, uh, Steve Lambert and his team asked uh, a, a, a bunch of them, you know, would you be willing to talk about why you voted? Not all of them agreed, of course, but the ones who agreed and consented uh, were then uh, video recorded. And so that's, he had posted some of their uh, conversations online. So I contacted Steve uh, via email saying, hey, you know, this is great. Uh, could I have your permission to transcribe some of these videos because I was playing a chapter on it. He came back saying, not only uh, will, uh, will I give you permission, but I have like 300 other uh, interviews that I'm not really using. Would you like them? I was like, yeah. So that was incredible. So I had access to this database of over 300 interviews, had them transcribed, and, um, and so that was the basis of the book. Okay. So I'd like to give you a little background on how this started. So the, the art project started uh, around 2010, 2011, and it was in the wake of the economic crisis of uh, 2007, 2008. Okay, so for those of you who might not know, this is gonna be the next few minutes a little bit of an economic history. So in the past 30 years, there have been at least 15 major crises worldwide, okay? And since the ongoing uh, global economic crisis, erupted um, still, it, even though uh, the numbers suggest otherwise, uh, many people still have not fully recovered, okay? And during this time, economists, the public, uh, politicians, and so forth have argued why this happened and the possible solutions. And to give you a little bit of a um, background here, 51% uh, of working Americans now make less than $30,000 a year which puts them near the poverty line of 24,230 for a family of four, okay? And it goes beyond that as well, because in the past 40 years, many Americans have experienced uh, some, if not all, of the following, right? Uh, their workplaces deunionized, primarily in the manufacturing sector, the outsourcing of these jobs, declining wages and salaries in the face of downsizing, Okay, many are now working in the service sector in which the federal minimum wage, as you know, is $7.25 an hour. There is the movement to fight for 15. Okay, but it's only been adopted, I believe, by one state. Okay, uh, permanent unemployment or underemployment for many. The growth of part time jobs, including right here at the university, uh, the adjunct, which is now uh, adjuncts now comprise roughly 75% of all university faculty. Okay. And of course, as many of you know, the increase of student loan debt as well as consumer debt. Okay. 
So uh, I think it should be clear, hopefully it should be clear to all of you, that obviously the economy occupies a central concern in our lives. And so it, it really kind of leads us to ask, what, you know, what, what, how do people actually make sense of the economy known as capital? What does it actually mean to them through its discourses, the discourses of capitalism? And what does it actually mean to them in terms of their own lived experiences and narratives, which we'll hear a few. Okay? And how, how do they actually make sense of all this and describe its impacts on their lives? And obviously this question is not just an academic one. Um, it is one that I've been uh, interested in for a long time, and we see the actual ramifications of it in the past few months. So a little bit of background here. Um, uh, in terms of the economic cycles, the booms and the busts in the United States, in the context of the United States. Uh, this was pre President uh, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR as he was otherwise known. He was elected in 1932, at the, the, a couple of years into the start of the Great Depression. Okay? And he crafted, he and his administration crafted what was known as the New Deal. Okay? And their response, along with, it wasn't just him, of course, it was also the organized labor of American workers at that time, which was very powerful, the CIO, uh, the Congress of Industrial Organization, the workers, uh, and they had uh, pushed the uh, administration. And so he implemented a lot of policies that came to be known as the New Deal. Uh, and this, uh, he announced the second Bill of Rights, it was actually in the 1940s, I believe in 1944, as you can see, uh, every American has the right to a job, right, decent home, medical care. Now this is very interesting here, the discourse uh, during that time would now be seen in the context of 2017 in the U.S. as one of a unrepentant socialist. And it's also interesting that the past few Republican presidents in the ensuing uh, years of the New Deal, uh, Eisenhower, kept the tax rate at close to 90 percent, uh, Nixon was 70 percent, and yet when uh, President Obama tried to increase the tax rate to 40 percent, he was accused of being a socialist. So here you have the presidents before, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, taxing the 1% at a very high rate compared with what is now, okay? And, and so this is really, this uh, uh, can be characterized as two approaches to uh, uh, capitalism in terms of government, right? One is the, what has been called the traditional or the Keynesian approach, named after the British economist John Maynard Keynes, uh, whose book was published in 1936, and it was basically an answer to saving capitalism. Right? And it was also a pushback in response to the organized communist movements that were happening uh, around the world and of course in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Um, it, it, during the Great Depression, uh, many capitalists were very worried that there was going to be a co uh, communist uh, movement, a strong one, overthrowing capitalism in both the UK and the US. So Keynes came out saying there's a way, there's a third way. And the way is that the government is going to be actively managing capital or what's called state capitalism in the form of the FDR and the New Deal. In other words, tax the rich, use that surplus wealth, build the infrastructure with that, uh, uh, the tax money, we're gonna create jobs and so forth, okay? Um, the second approach that was um, started by <coughs> Friedrich Hayek, uh, and it was actually, it has been circulated among some German uh, intellectuals, Hayek is, uh, was Australian, uh, Austrian, um, in the 1920s, but he came out with a book in the, in the 1940s, 1944, The Road to Serfdom, in which he had said that basically the two twin evils of both the Soviet Union and the United States, with its Keynesian liberal approach, were both threats to freedom. So the only road to freedom was to have the free market. Okay? And then for a number of years, he was not taken seriously in the economics discipline. He was seen as kind of a crackpot until a guy by the name of Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago took up his ideas and in 1962 published Capitalism and Freedom. And just the collocation of those two words cemented a particular discourse, uh, of course, in, uh, along with the Cold War um, settlement in which um, communism was seen as totalitarianism Capitalism was, and was seen as the equivalent of democracy and freedom. 
Okay? But Friedman was basically taking Hayek's idea and saying, well, you know, any restriction on capitalism is basically communism. And we don't want that here in the US. Okay? And so it was in this context that uh, uh, the rise of Thatcher in the UK and then her um, <clears throat> companion across the, the pond, as it were, Ronald Reagan, uh, with his trickle-down economics, or there is no alternative, right? Now, you know, this is very interesting because during uh, this time, between the 1930s to the 1970s, um, there was a, a significant migration of white working class primarily males who had been in the workforce, who had gained middle class status thanks to the, the New Deal of the FDR. So by the 1950s, they had the so-called American dream, the home, a car in the driveway. And by the 1970s, though, because of a conf confluence of certain events, such as the OPEC oil crisis, stagflation, and so forth, uh, Reagan was able to capitalize um, what they had seen, rightfully so, is declining uh, wages, right, declining uh, jobs in the manufacturing sector. And so for those of you who, were, uh, who grew up in the U.S. and who are, are old enough, um, uh, there was a show uh, that started in 1970 called All in the Family, starring Carol O'Connor, who actually in real life was quite progressive, but played an arch-conservative named Archie Bunker, who worked as a unionized foreman on a Brooklyn loading dock. Archie Bunker and his family lived in Queens, New York, that's the show. And I grew up literally down the street from where Archie Bunker house was, as it was depicted in the TV show. So my neighborhood was Archie Bunker. We, we lived next door to um, uh, an Irish American. He worked as a cop on the NYPD. Um, and there were a couple other people in the neighborhood. Um, that uh, were Archie Bunkers, and so that was my neighborhood, and so as I grew up, there was the kind of the enculturation of that, and so <clears throat> in 1980, when I was eligible to vote for the first time, I proudly cast my vote for Ronald Reagan. Um, <laughs> I had heard him on the car radio uh, saying, it's nice to be liked, isn't it better to be respected? And that resonated with me because it was in the wake of the Iran hostage crisis, in the wake of the defeat in the Vietnam War, and I, I was like 19 years old, and I thought, that's true, you know, my country is just going to hell. You know, Carter's not doing anything. Reagan is going to make America great again. And I voted for him. Luckily, uh, my politics changed soon thereafter, um, <laughs> thanks to what's called education, uh, I was, uh, started taking economics courses and um, it was very interesting. I went to a small uh, liberal arts college in eastern Pennsylvania and somehow the economics faculty had hired all these young assistant professors who were coming out of the new left, two of whom went on to found the journal Rethinking Marxism. And so thanks to their corrupting influences, um, I, I started to see um, the society in a different way, okay? And that really raises the issue of how we actually view the world. Now, um, there are these two very interesting films that if you've uh, ever, if, I, I highly recommend not only seeing them, of course, but the documentaries um, made with, by the, uh, made starring with the Slovenian ph uh, philosopher Slavoj Žižek, uh, The Pervert's Guide to Cinema and The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, in which he discusses these two films at length. And I think you recognize this one, right? Uh, Neo, the, 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 the blue pill, or take the red pill, right? Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the red pill, you just uh, go back to sleep, but the blue pill, you go down in the rabbit hole, and you actually see the world as it is, right? Um, this film, you may not know, it was directed by John Carpenter and released uh, by Hollywood in 1988, and it's entitled They Live. So in this story, uh, this is a, a guy, he's looking for work, he's out of work, and um, he comes across this uh, plot uh, when he realizes that society is actually run by these intergalactic aliens. And the, why, the reason why he's able to find out is because he comes across this a small organized group that's trying to pass out these sunglasses. When you put them on, then you actually see the world as it is. 
Now, what's interesting is that Zizek talks about that in the Perfect Guide to Cinema, uh, I'm sorry, to Ideology, in which his best friend, who uh, had to leave Detroit because there were no jobs, the steel companies were shutting down, so he moves to Los Angeles, right, to find a job, he leaves his wife and his kids behind. Earlier in the film, they were having a conversation in which um, his friend is saying, you know, everyone, uh, the steel companies are laying everybody off, and you know what they gave themselves? And the, the lead actor, a character says, what? He goes, they gave themselves raises. And you know what we should do? Next time, we should just take a sledged uh, hammer to one of their fancy fucking cars. And, and, and he says, well, I think you should just calm down. He goes, well, I'm, I'm all out of patience. Now, interestingly, though, later on in the movie, after he discovers these magic sunglasses, he tries to put the glasses on his friend, but his friend resists. And there's literally a seven-minute street fight in which the two of them are, you know, rolling around. And he was actually a former professional wrestler, so. They're rolling around in this alleyway, and you can see they're all, like, you know, bloody. And he finally forces the guy to wear the glasses. Now, this raises the question, though, why would his friend, who had already seen what was happening, be so reluctant to put on the sunglasses? So Zizek's argument is that you must be forced to be, to be free. Freedom hurts. I'm not quite sure I quite agree with that assessment, but it does raise the issue of what is ideology? How do we actually construct our ideological uh, views of the world? Okay, and Stuart Hall, as uh, some of you know, uh, who you've read extensively in 603, um, it says this. Okay. All right, so you know, this idea that, uh, you know, kind of going on that metaphor of the glasses and so forth in terms of you know, what are the ways in which we have access to particular uh, concepts or ways to actually conceptualize? Because we're seeing the same thing, or are we, right? We might be looking at the same uh, system or production, and yet we come to different conclusions, okay? And so, uh, Antonio Gramsci, if you don't know him, was this uh, Italian uh, philosopher, journalist, activist, who was born in the, on the island of um, Sardinia, had moved to Turin to uh, pursue his university degrees. And he was quite active um, uh, in Italy during the, 19, um, uh, during the teens and then the early 1920s. But then there was a guy named Benito Mussolini who came to power and saw Gramsci as a true threat and imprisoned him for over 10 years. Uh, whereupon uh, Gramsci was uh, released because of uh, incredibly poor health and died soon after. But during that time, those 10 years, he wrote was has come to known as uh, the prison notebooks. And part of that, uh, part of his many writings within the prison notebooks and letters to his, um, his wife and his uh, wife's sister was this notion of what he called common sense and good sense. So this idea of common sense was that you know, people uh, uh, collectively, we, we develop our communal shared beliefs around certain things. And of course, they're historically situated, contextualized, and so forth. Part of it's based on folklore, part of it's based on wisdom, part of it's based on religion, and so forth, right? Uh, so for maybe one example I would give, that I would give to my students when I was teaching in Hong Kong, would be that traditional, well, about, a, I'd say about 120 years ago, um, for women of a certain social class, the accepted common sense belief was that they should have their feet bound because, you know, their, their husbands are wealthy enough, they don't need to work, and why do you need to leave the house anyway? So we'll just bound your feet from birth, so by the time you're 20, your feet will be only this big and you won't be able to walk. When I asked my students uh, in 2013, I was like, well, so how many of you would be agree to that? Of course, they were like, hey, crazy? I will say, well, see, and that is how common sense has collapsed, that part. So common sense is never obviously eternal, but it's always shifting and, and situated historically as it changes. And now, why does it change? Because what Gramsci has argued is that within that uh, common sense, 
there is a kernel what he called of good sense. And that good sense is that what, you know, things that we might think of as common sense. But when you look at children playing with their toys or, you know, or they're, you know, having some food, usually little arguments will break out and usually the argument would be something like, he or she got more than I did. That's not fair. Or, hey, Joey, Sally, share your toys. So, it's the sense of this communal thing uh, where we, you know, it, it, it's part of what we, he said about good sense, but that where we, uh, it's not a question of, you know, we have to kind of introduce some radical idea, but there's something that's already existed in our society, right? And, but to make it more critical into something that becomes the new common sense, right? Now, an example of how common sense has been mobilized in different directions, though, had been uh, the examples of five years ago, the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Tea Party. Okay, so this side is from Occupy Wall Street, right? If you remember the episode in Seinfeld. Okay, now this is a sign from the Tea Party. Um, uh, okay, so here again is one of the major discourses uh, in, in, in the context of the U.S. culture and history that socialism is not freedom. Uh, it'd be very interesting to talk to the person who's holding that sign to ask him or her what his or her definition of socialism is, right? Okay, now over here though, it's also interesting, the more the government uh, takes, the less we make, right? Now, it was very interesting when you actually looked at the Occupy movement and the Tea Party because they were both saying that, in a sense, capitalism wasn't working for them, but they attributed it to different agents. So Occupy Wall Street obviously targeted Wall Street, but the Tea Party targeted President Obama and the government, right? But in terms of their lived realities, you could not dispute that both uh, demographics uh, represented by both movements were suffering economically. It was just who they were blaming, okay? Now, there's also this interesting discourse that somehow America is this right-wing nation but if you, according to the Pew Research Center, uh, in this, as you can see, just uh, a less, uh, year and a half, less than a year and a half ago, even people who identify as Republicans and conservatives with Republicans, and of course Democrats, but even with the Republicans, the majority says that the economic system unfairly favors powerful interests. Okay, so what is uh, capitalism? Um, so I don't want to have this... Uh, 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 assumption that everyone understands it the same way. Uh, is it free markets or private enterprise, as we hear often? Okay. However, Richard Wolff, uh, the economist Richard Wolff, who was uh, a longtime faculty member at UMass Amherst, um, has argued, uh, pointed out rather, that our markets were not unique to capitalism. That in fact, feudal and slave-based economies used markets. Okay, and neither is free enterprise because, again, feudal-based economies, slave plantations, they were, they were free to set their own prices without any statement uh, restrictions or mandates. Okay, now the other, another argument about capitalism is the private ownership of the means of production. Okay, how many of you, I mean, well, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have public stock in companies like, I don't know, Apple or what have you? Right? In fact, the majority of companies are owned by the public. So, in the case of the Soviet Union, and this was one of the major mistakes that Richard Wolff argues they made, was they were going on this uh, definition of capitalism as the private ownership, so they simply replaced, they didn't simply, but they replaced private ownership with social ownership. Problem solved? Hmm. Okay. And this idea of fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Okay, so things are better now, though, right? Compared with feudalism, right? Feudalism, my God, nobody wants to go to feudalism. You know, you're a serf, right? Working on some lord's land, right? So you work six days of the week. You know, the seventh day you went to wherever, you know, the day of rest. And so, but of those six days that you worked, three of them, you knew you were working for the Lord. So you were tilling the land, everything went straight to the Lord, right? The other three days, which was called a corvée, you worked, but you worked for yourself. So anything you get gathered from the land, that was yours. That was the agreement. It was clearly marked off. 
interestingly, <clears throat> in capitalism, as analyzed by this uh, German uh, moral reprobate, I forgot his name, uh, because he's almost never taught in the United States. I wonder why. Uh, has said that actually capitalism is the class structure of production of surplus value produced by workers. Okay, now what does this all mean? So, the working day uh, under capitalism, in contrast to feudalism where you knew the first three days, okay, you work for the masters, okay, let me get to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that's for myself. Capitalism, let's just say the typical nine to five day, which hours of those days are you actually working for yourself? And which hours are you working for the capitalists? It's not quite clear. So what uh, Marx did, one of, his, one of his brilliant, many brilliant contributions in capital was to, or, uh, to analyze this idea of surplus value, surplus labor or value. Now, capitalism, uh, surplus value is not uh, specific to capitalism, it's also specific to feudalism. However, under capitalism, it, the, the lines are much blurrier. So, for example, you're working eight hours a day, nine to five, you get paid your wages, right? Okay, you get your, let's just say you get paid your wages, but out of the hundred dollars, let's just say, that hundred dollars you already earned in the first three hours. So the next five hours, you're essentially working for the man. And he, usually he, capitalist, is taking all that from you for pure profit. That's in, in a nutshell. Uh, that's what he calls surplus labor or surplus value. But it goes beyond that because not only is he taking that, but you don't even have a say in how that the surplus value you're producing is to be reappropriated back to you, right? I mean, you might ask for a raise, but he can say no, and then you have two choices. You can quit, which also has this idea of capitalism like, oh, I can sell my labor power anywhere I want but no one's hiring, I wonder why. Uh, or you can just say, okay, fine, okay? All right, and so that was, uh, when I characterized this to my students before, <clears throat> they said, God, that, that kind of sounds like a dictatorship where the majority of us aren't deciding on it. I was like, hmm, okay. And so that's essentially what happened with the Soviet Union. They, they had transitioned from a private to a state capitalism uh, even though it was, it, it was owned by the people in name, basically, it was still decided by select few the appropriation of the surplus by the bureaucrats. So in effect, the, the producers and the appropriators were not made identical. Okay. All right. So let's get to, um, let's get to some of these um, uh, participants who uh, they've been called everyday economists because we are all everyday economists. We complain about, we complain about our jobs, we complain about the, the crappy pay, we complain about you know, uh, everything related to the economy. And of course, part of that is, is specifically also in the United States culture, this notion of winners and losers, okay? All right, so let's hear this first participant here. Yeah. Not, it might not be synced up, so. It works for me. And the reason it works for me is it's the basis of a market economy. Uh, the, uh, I've been uh, in all sectors of our, our, our economy from government work, nonprofit, I worked for a large corporate organization. Uh, I'm 76 years old, and now I work for myself. I'm a glass artist. And I determine what kind of products I sell. I determine the price of the product. I have uh, free reign over where I uh, get the uh, raw materials for my products. And I determine who I will sell it to. Uh, I don't advertise. My advertisement uh, is the product line itself. People see what I've done and they would like me to do something for them. Uh, my wife and I are traveling uh, up here. We came to New York to visit with our grandson. Uh, and then uh, we're going on a cruise for seven days, uh, and uh, he is a good demonstration of capitalism too, because he's a college graduate. His girlfriend is a graduate of the School of Visual Arts here in New York City. They're both working, they both have jobs, um, and uh, they're doing extremely well. So. Uh, 
I'm, capitalism is not a dirty word to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. So he, he says a number, a number of things which we uh, can't uh, go into too much analysis because of time. But interesting, one of the first things he, say, he says is the basis of a market economy, right? And, we, and which I just argue that, uh, the, the, again, the market economy is not specific to capitalism alone. The interesting thing is that he's also talked about that, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he identifies with capitalism very strongly, and yet, you know, from what he just talked about, he worked for government, uh, he worked for the government, nonprofit, worked corporate organization, and yet nowhere does he suggest that he was actually the CEO, okay? And yet, so one of the questions would be, why does he identify with capitalism so strongly if he was not the CIO, CEO? Obviously, life's been good to him in a material sense, Okay, he's now 76, he's working as an artist, he's talking about how he's able to decide the products and all that, but that's not much different from a 16th century European artisan working in the feudal Europe in terms of an artist um, selling um, his or her own products. The other interesting thing that I just want to quickly highlight was when he said that capitalism at the very end, capitalism is not a dirty word to me, that almost is like very um, Bakhtinian in terms of this idea that uh, what Bakhtin had says that certain words are overpopulated with the intentions of others, okay? And so this is almost his idea of this uh, pushing back on capitalism as a dirty word is almost this kind of a counter hegemonic ideological undertone or subtext to that where he's explicitly acknowledging it and trying to dismiss this. Because otherwise, if capitalism was so great, why would it ever be a dirty word to anyone? All right, this, uh, he's one of my favorites. Let's see why? Uh, it does, actually. I think it works for everybody. It's less destructive and more productive than any other type of uh, organized society there is. How does it work for me in particular? Well, if you have all good habits and you work hard, stay straight, you'll have a better life. But capitalism doesn't do anything for me. I do it for myself. I don't need somebody to tell me to do anything. I don't want anything from anybody. I'll rise on my own effort, as will everybody else. You know, a lot of people think the government should give them everything. Well, the government that gives you everything can take away everything. Uh, you know, I, I, the premise is a little kind of off. As a society, we have to be organized somehow. I mean, we're 350 million, wherever you're from. I mean, what, what are our choices? Communism, socialism, capitalism? Capitalism sucks the least out of all of them. Put it that way. That's probably the fairest. Everything else is worse. Where else you want to go? Russia, Tehran, China, Cuba, North Korea, the workers' paradise? Maybe not. In my opinion, for whatever that's worth. Right? Quote me. Happy trails. And thank you. All right, great. Yeah, this is why I came back to the East Coast for. Uh, you know, he, again, these are the kind of guys I grew up. But yeah, you know, it, it's a, his common sense uh, uh, discourses are very powerfully appealing because, on the face of it, you, uh, some of it you can't. You know, you might say, oh, "Well, of course, it's common sense." Like, I mean, if you were actually thinking about, hmm, if I had a choice to live in the UK, Australia, Canada, the US, or some other, you know, Western industrialized country, or North Korea, hmm. Right, um, but the way he's framing it is uh, has obviously the uh, part of that is the kind of from Reagan, where he when he says that you know the government uh, that uh, gives you everything can take away everything is almost a dialogical echoing of Reagan's famous government isn't the solution government is the problem right. Um, you know it, it's also interesting we don't have that much time to go into but one of his. Um, on the discourse uh, analytic level, if you notice, this pragmatic marker of you know, um, and that is an East Coast thing, but this idea of saying you know has several functions, one of which is saying is, what I'm saying is the truth, anything else is bullshit, you know, okay? Um, but 
I think the most powerful uh, common sense appeal of his is to dismiss these uh, kind of basically alternatives to capitalism. And, and so when you think about it, you know, especially for those of us who grew up in the U.S. and then we grew up with all those Hollywood movies from the Cold War or whatever, the propaganda reels, if you want to say that, the long lines of people waiting for food, okay, maybe once in a while, I don't know, of the Soviet Union, it almost seemed like a nightmarish kind of uh, dystopia. And so part of that is what he's kind of referencing, I would believe. But it's this idea that uh, if you're saying that, uh, if you're comparing, you know, just only two ways, North Korea or uh, capitalism U.S. style, it doesn't leave any room for other alternatives. Okay, so this, this, and this guy here. I voted for capitalism. It's the only system that ever does work. It's the only system that brings any kind of fairness, any kind of opportunity. You know, any place on earth where you don't have capitalism, you may have equality, but you have uh, misery to accompany the equality. I, I think it's outrageous that it's even close, let alone that capitalism is, is losing. I mean, I think that's kind of reflected in what's going on in the country today. You know, that's why we're on this uh, uh, downhill slide. You know, because people don't appreciate the opportunities of capitalism. They would rather live in this world of entitlement and let uh, supposedly somebody else pay. You know, somebody else. But sooner or later, you're going to run out of somebody else's. So you're saying that um, part of the Of course, they they want to be completely reliant on the on the government. They want the government to make all kinds of decisions for them. Here in New York, we have a a mayor that that wants to decide how much soda we could drink. You know, it, it's really getting that bad. Well, when I voted, it, it was a 409 against capitalism and a 360 something for it. And uh, you know, as long as the attitude is like that in, in this country, we're going to have you know, major problems. We're going to have, I'm sure if you did the vote in Detroit, which uh, just went bankrupt, it would probably be uh, unanimous against capitalism. But meanwhile, when, when uh, Detroit was a capital of capitalism, and uh, the auto industry was centered there, and, and people believed in capitalism, it was a, a bustling, very rich city. Now. It's, uh, it's like what Hiroshima would have looked like if we were really mad. Anything else you can That's it. Vote for capitalism while you still can vote. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we we could discuss it more, but I want to go on to the other two participants. But obviously, there's a lot there we can unpack. But let's uh, li listen to, uh, quickly to the last two participants, and then we can start to open it up to discussion. Oops. I did that. Next one. Well, I'm a member of the middle class. I still have a disposable income so that I can do some investments on Wall Street, which have been, except after they, they tanked after the meltdown, they came back up and they're doing pretty well for me. I am a homeowner, and so I get a wonderful tax deduction against my you know, income so that I can, uh, my, my taxable income is lower because of the way the law is structured. Um, so it works for me. I have, I can travel, I, I have a nice house, I live in a nice neighborhood. So it works. I mean, that that's the focus here is not what I think about capitalism. Not if I think that, that it's a great system or that it's, uh, it's not in trouble right now in our country. Just it is working for me, and honestly, it is working for me. You don't want me to say more? Yes, yes. If I was asked if it's the best system, I would have, I would say false. If I say if you if I were being asked, um, can we can we can't, can we do better than this? I would say true. Too many, the, there's too much of a disp wealth disparity. The wealthy are uh, 
the, what is it, the 1% of the 1% have most of the wealth, have most of the power, uh, the, our own democratic system is in peril in terms of who gets elected and why, and, and the, just right now we're, we're building, we're putting a lot of money into a wall in, across the Mexican United States border to keep people out who want to work here. There aren't enough jobs for people to, somehow to build infrastructure in our country. Bridges are falling apart. Roads need rebuilding. Where, what about the school situation? I mean, there's something that's out of rational sense here. There's a political party that is demanding that food stamps be cut to balance the budget. I think this is all wrong. And I don't know how much of this is capitalism and how much of this is um, a failing democratic system. Okay, uh, and then let's go to this last person here, and then we'll open it up soon. No. Capitalism does not work for me. Uh, well, for instance, my mother works in a company. She works all day. Sometimes she goes in on the weekends. Who gets all the money? We don't have any money. She's making all that money for somebody else. Who doesn't have to go in on the weekends? Yeah, anybody who works anywhere, they bust their ass. Making tons of money for who? Themselves? I don't know any rich people. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Uh, to kind of conclude, Frederick Jameson said, someone once said, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. We can now revise that and witness the attempt to imagine capitalism by way of imagining the end of the world. Uh, Mark Fisher, who just actually just passed away a few weeks ago, uh, in his book, uh, 2009 book, Capitalist Realism, wrote, there's a widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is not impossible to even imagine a coherent alternative to it. Okay? And so, kind of finally, these uh, questions, I open it up uh, to everyone here. So, how can we, you know, utilize these discussions around capitalism as part of what's been called uh, not just critical pedagogy, which I think you're, uh, which, uh, everyone's familiar with, but a public pedagogy, which is a pedagogy that takes be, uh, place beyond the classroom, the physical uh, classroom on social media, and insights, public spaces like the Occupy movement was an example of public pedagogy. How can we utilize these discussions, okay? And then, in terms of a pedagogical engagement, right, but the aim of transforming this common sense making, though, so that it does not take the form of an imposition of a superior worldview or understanding of the world originating outside of the previously accepted common sense. Okay, and so uh, my research has been really kind of to engage with this um, uh, in terms of using the constructs that they, they relied upon to discuss constructs like democracy, like freedom, and to say, to kind of look for avenues or ways to mobilize that into that critical good sense.